Morning, morning, everybody. I want to stand to your feet with us. I'm glad you're here today. Welcome to Community Baptist. Wrong song, Caden. Would you go to the first one? Remember those walls that we called sin chain. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. And this is our God. And this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. And this is our God. This is what he does. He saves. Remember that fear that took our breath away A faith so weak that we can barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper And now those altars in the wilderness I tell the story of his faith
There's a peace that outlasts darkness, a hope that's in the blood. And there's a future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hands and all I need you will provide just like you always have and I'm fighting a battle you've already to him we're here because we know how the story ends today
morning. You guys can have a seat. Welcome to Community Baptist Church. If it's your first time, we would love to meet you. So after the service, um, I know that Doug will be in the back um, meeting folks out front, and the rest of us would love to shake your hand. If you want to know more about our church and get connected, there's a QR code up on the screen. You can scan that with your phone, and it'll take you to our website and our church app for you to get connected. So I have a few announcements that are going on the next couple of weeks. Okay, so first is actually after worship, our kids are going to be going over to our kids' church so they can exit out these doors. Are we changing it? Yeah, okay. They're going to exit out these doors. You'll see all the kiddos line up, and you can send your kids that way. We are also doing a back-to-school fair, and so our church has committed to 300 spiral notebooks. I think we're, no? Composition. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Composition books. That's actually specific if you are in the, you know, buying of uh, school supplies. They're very specific. So we have, what, half of them donated maybe? Yeah. And so we have another week. So, oh, okay. So next up, our vision gathering is tonight. I am the one who actually coordinated this, and so I'm really excited about it. It's going to be really laid back, very much like a fellowship, but just an open floor. I'm going to just kind of guide a discussion to hear from everybody your heart on what you're looking for in our church growth, in the pastor search, and just moving ahead. It's at um, Helen and David Acox. If you need that address, find me or find Helen, and we can give that to you. There is also a sign up. So if you go to our app, and you click into the event, there's a little sign up genius, and in there you can see what's left to be signed up for. I think most of the food's covered, but last I looked, we needed some basic things like plates, cups, things like that. Otherwise, I'll be going through the church stock <laughs> after service to see what we can take. So I hope you guys can come at 4 p.m. Kiddos are welcome, they'll be swimming. Um, next is our night of worship, and we have that coming up in a week from today. We have Pastor Brian Treadaway coming to speak, and it's a really cool thing that we're doing as a church, but the hope is that we are being able to reach the community and invite others, other churches even, to come and join together. So the only way that people are going to know about it, past the folks in this room, are for us to tell them. So Wednesday night, I know a lot of people are coming up just to help. It's our summer of service. And so what we're going to have for those that are interested is flyers. You can take those flyers to your place of work, to your neighbors, but we're also going to take that time to go out into the community and actually hand those flyers out, whether we're going to put them in places of business or take them to neighborhoods so that people are aware. We're also going to do that the following week for another event, the next event, I think that's on. Did it get missed? Just, just back one I think slide. We, yeah, that's I think we went back. Social. So the next, uh, this is a small reach. This is something that's been on my heart to do for several years, and I've never made it happen. And so um, I decided I'm just going to host the event, but I would love you guys to help. So Helen and David have, again, offered their home. They live right around the corner from us. So we kind of live somewhat in the same neighborhood. And the best way to get people to come to church is to build a relationship with them. And so we might as well start in our own very little neighborhood. So we're going to host an ice cream social. I'm asking for sign up help with the ice cream, again, using a sign up genius link. And then those of you that can volunteer to come, we'll wear Community Baptist shirts and then we'll just introduce ourselves. You know, it'll allow the ACOX and us to meet our neighbors, but then at the same time, we can introduce them to you guys and build relationships, and hopefully they will come and visit our church. So with that, I hope we'll see you tonight. Y'all pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for bringing everyone here today. As we sing this song, this song is a is a blessing, is an encouragement, is an exhortation over you and over this church today. Jesus, we ask that you would take these words and make them a reality in people's lives. Only you know what we're going through. So you'd be here today.
the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. I pray for. Y'all may be seated.
Good morning, and it's good to see each of you this morning. I'm going to be uh, continuing with our life-changing conversations in John chapter 3 this morning. And as always, if you have our app, all of the information and scripture and the slides that's going to be behind me is on the app. I encourage you to, uh, uh, to download that if you haven't, and uh, just follow along with us here. John chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Now, this scripture is when Jesus came to Nicodemus, or, or I'm sorry, when Nicodemus came to Jesus in the middle of the night and had a conversation, and we've been talking about these conversations, and uh, I encourage you to, I hope to go back, if you missed last Sunday or Sunday before, that you'll, you'll listen to some of, some of those conversations. And Bradley, can we do something about this Christmas tree that I've got going here? I feel like, you remember one of those, uh, uh, what is it? Those, you remember those Christmas trees that used to have those circular things that you follow around? That's what I, that's what I feel like. Uh, but anyway, the conversation uh, that that Jesus was having with uh, with Nicodemus was not like the other conversations that we that, that we have looked at. Remember last week that the uh, uh, the woman at the well was so excited about what the conversation consisted of. And as the excitement grew, she left her water pots there. She ran back to the city. She was telling everybody about Jesus. And with this particular conversation, we don't see that in Nicodemus. Uh, what, we, what we see in this conversation is that after it was over, we don't see anything of excitement. It kind of reminded me of me when I heard about Jesus. Remember I talked last week about how weird I look when I get too excited? And, and people think that there's actually something wrong with me. Well, I feel that that I'm probably fall under the the Nicodemus uh, type of personality. That I that that when when he met with Jesus, there there was not that enthusiasm or that excitement as we go through there. But this is one of those conversations that was life changing for many. In fact, it is as we go through this, you'll recognize many of these verses that you probably have heard before and that you have mem even memorized before but wasn't sure where it, where it came from. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. So let's go to uh, uh, the first slide. In John chapter 3, starting with verse 1, I'll, I'll read verses 1 and 2. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher uh, who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you do unless God were with him. And so Nicodemus came to Jesus in the middle of the night because remember, Nicodemus was a part of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were very judgmental. And even if you were seen with Jesus, then you were criticized about even being in his presence. And, the, and Nicodemus knew this, and so he came sought after Jesus in the, at, at night, and he came to him acknowledging who he was. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher and that has come from God, and for no one could perform these signs that you do unless God has sent you. This was the beginning of Jesus' public ministry right after this. And, but the first thing that I really want to focus on is the seeking and pursuing after Jesus. If you have never received Christ as your Savior, then we will be seeking and pursuing after Jesus. And, and, and forgive me if I've told you this story before, but I think it's worthy of telling again. When I was out of high school, I started going to a church that was local where we lived. And I was just the Sunday morning, every once in a while person. You, you know that person that just came every every now and then when the service was was going on. And then one Sunday I was I was there and this girl came in with her mother. And I was I thought she was very pretty. I thought she was very outgoing and and I, I wish Terry had the nursery today so I wouldn't have to talk to her about this about this girl. And uh and so and and so she she became involved in the church and I became one that was pursuing after her. So she got involved in choir. So I started going to choir. 
she went to the singles group Sunday school class. So I thought it was about time that I went to the singles group Sunday school class. She began going places with the singles group after church. I thought that would be a good thing for me to do. She started coming to Wednesday night prayer meetings. And there I was, praying on Wednesday night. Now, I'm not saying that this pursuit that I had had anything to do with God whatsoever, so get that out of your mind. But yet, this pursuit that I had it eventually transferred over to Christ. And by the way, that person was obviously Terry, and uh, it wasn't the other girl that came to church that one time before she, but anyway, so, so our seeking and our pursuing after Jesus needs to be just as that, that, that from the beginning of our relationship, throughout our relationship with Christ, there needs to be the seeking and the pursuing of who Jesus is, because it is the the basis of all of our relationships that we have in our life. You see, your relationships will only be as deep as your relationship with Christ. If you stop pursuing and stop seeking after this relationship and stop seeking and pursuing after the relationship with Christ, then so all other relationships will cease. They will just be just the way that they are. For instance, I cannot love deep. Because this flesh is not capable of loving deep, but through my love for, for our Heavenly Father and through His love, I can now love deep. When we're seeking and pursuing after Jesus, just as Nicodemus did, we need to continue and we need to move forward with that. Don't think it's just something that we do at the very beginning of our relationship with Him. Don't think it's something that we do. You know, many years I've, I've counseled and I've, and I've shared and one of the questions that I get the most when couples come together is, what do I need to do so that she will change or he will change that our relationship will be so much better? What, what do we need to do? Pastor, how do, we, how do we need to change her? How do we need to change him? Because it's not me that's doing it. It's things that she has done. And so it's a it's shocking revelation that, in this relationship and what's going to help through it is our relationship with Christ. Because if our relationship with Christ is seeking and pursuing him, you're going to look at people differently than you look at them now. You're going to look at me differently. This sermon is going to sound different if you're in the spirit seeking and pursuing Jesus than it is if you were forced to come here this morning for some reason. Are you all with me? It's true. The, the seeking and pursuing after Jesus in this relationship is going to help all other relationships in your life. So that needs to be the pursuing of our life in everything that we do. It should never cease. We will never get too old to say that I've had enough and I don't want to pursue this anymore. The second thing that I want to draw from this, this conversation that, that Nicodemus had was in John chapter 3. It says this, Jesus uh, replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And then again in verse 7, he says, do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. Now this is something that we share with people all the time that never receive Christ as their Savior. You must have a spiritual birth. Nicodemus didn't really understand that, and he questioned it just like we would question it. You mean I got to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, no, what is flesh is flesh and what is spirit is spirit. I want to take us back many, many years, 40 plus years, when our first child was born. It was Daniel. And it was a different day and time then because back then the hospital and the doctor would tell you that you sit here in the nursery, or in the, uh, in the waiting room, Dad, and we'll let you know when the baby's ready for you to see when the baby's all cleaned up. And then I could just go to the window and see the new baby. Those were the great days, okay? <laughs> and then there came a change at some point when they decided that it would be good for the, for the dad to be in the same room with the mom when she's giving birth. And so brings us to this story of Lacey. When I told them, I said, look, I will faint, period, if I see any sight of blood or anything that's really 
weird looking. And so they put the they put a a little sheet between uh, me and what was going on down there. Okay. And yet I didn't realize that in the process of this there would also be noise, like noise. You know, well, you know, Keisha can explain it to you if you don't know what noise I'm talking about. And 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 so it was a rough birth for me. It really was. I had I had a really really tough time with with Lacey during that time. But it was it was all over. And then instead of cleaning Lacey up, apparently we're just gonna it's she's just gonna be handed to us with all the stuff on her. I don't know what that's what that's called. Anyway. Uh, it 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 was it was just a horrible experience. Terry Terry may, Terry may think differently, but yet it was just horrible. So, but but it reminded me of being born. Being born physically is is interesting. I'm so thankful that being born in rebirth of spiritually is is nothing compared to that. I'm glad because there's there's so many people that I've I've had an opportunity to share Christ with and, and lead them to Christ, and there wasn't any of that that went along with it. But yet all of the stuff that's in our life and that needs to change and our pursuing of who Christ is will come to the point of when Jesus was trying to introduce to us about this new thing called being born again, trying to introduce to a world about what's about to take place when, when we're no longer just walking in the flesh, but we're walking in the spirit. That is something different to being born from the flesh and then also being born in the spirit. I know that Nicodemus probably had more questions than he, than he got answers through this, and we kind of understand it now, but this was the beginning of Jesus trying to lay out the picture. If you, if, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, and you look at his teaching throughout the Sermon on the Mount, you can find every point that's made in this reference, in this conversation to the Sermon on the Mount. It was fascinating when I did this study. So that's the second thing that we can draw from this particular uh, conversation. The third thing that we can draw is that he introduces us what is called eternal life. He tells us that, that this world that we live in is not the only world that we're, that we're going to be facing. We're going to be facing a, a world that is beyond the grave, which is eternal life. And he says this in verse 13, that no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the stake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus spoke of eternal life 34 times alone in the book of John. He spoke about it again and again and how important it is for us to be ready and how important it is for us to know that there's something beyond the grave. There's something beyond once we die. Once this physical body ends, once this physical body stops functioning, that there is, there is a place called eternal life. I feel so sorry for those who believe that this is it. That this is it. This is all you got. And then once you go to the grave, then you just go to the grave and it's all over. I feel sorry for those because there's so much more to life when we're talking about eternal life. We're talking about being able to give someone hope to know. Now, it's really interesting because I've met people before that didn't believe eternal life for people. But when you start talking about their pets, for some reason, they create a heaven for pets, which I didn't really understand. But yet, when it came to people, they didn't really even think about it. But they want to make sure that their pets are in a, a secure place in eternal life. Isn't that interesting? But yet, it is for us, those who have accepted Christ as our Savior, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. There is something more to this life than just this world that we live in. It's a new concept, a new concept at this time. I know Nicodemus probably, even though he was a teacher of the faith, even though he was a believer in who God was, 
even though that he knew that Jesus ascended somehow was it's connected to God, but yet he still didn't understand who Jesus actually was. He didn't understand what was who he was actually speaking to. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a conversation like this and have a conversation about eternal life and a conversation about what heaven is going to look like? You know, I, I know that the scripture is very vague on heaven, and I believe that because I believe that we couldn't even understand what heaven is going to look like and what heaven's going to be. You know, it, it's amazing to me when, it, when you think about that we're going to be having church all the time. Now, in this flesh, you're thinking, oh, my goodness. You mean we're never going to get out? You see, so, so this flesh can't understand that concept. But when we're in the spirit, we won't really care. We won't care. We'll be in the presence of God, and we will be there worshiping and praising and giving him the glory for eternity. I know that sounds kind of scary, but in the spirit, it's, it really is going to be fun. Here's the fourth thing that we get out of this conversation. That God loves us this much. This is a scripture that has been most memorized scripture in the Christian community. It is one that is still the most favorite scripture when asked, what is your favorite scripture in the Bible? And it's John 3.16. You may not have known the conversation and what, what was surrounding this, but this is what was said. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's the King James Version because that's the way I memorized it. Let's read it in the, the standard Christian Standard Bible. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Eternal life. God loves us this much. He loves us so much while we were yet sinners. He died on the cross. While we were yet struggling with life, he died on the cross. When we were not even a part of this world, he died on the cross for you and me. And he stressed that to Nicodemus, that God loves us this much. You may be here today or know someone that just doesn't feel loved at all. That just doesn't feel that love. You know, we're in a day and a time when feelings mean a lot more than they did when I was growing up. We didn't talk about our feelings at all, but now today's youth and today's society talks about their feelings. I just don't feel loved. Well, God's love can make you feel loved. You see, other people's love is based upon their actions or based upon how they treat you or based upon what you go through, but yet God's love fills that emptiness that's inside of our life, fills us up so much that you just know that you're loved. And, the, and not being loved or not feeling like you're loved is the main component for teenagers and adults to make horrible decisions in life. Yes, yes, mom, I know she's a stripper, but I really believe she's for me. Yes, yes, mom. I, I, I know I know that she's gone through some tough times, and I know I know she's married, and I know she's seeing somebody else on the side, but I know that this is the one for me. And so, see, it is the thrust of everything that we do in bad decisions, but God loves us, fills us up so much that we don't have that desire to make some of those weird decisions anymore out of our feelings that he loves us so much that he, he presented and he brought to us a eternal life in a heaven that we can look forward to. So if you're here today and you feel like you're continuing the search for things of this world, fill yourself up with the love of God because it really, really does matter. Here's the fifth thing in John 3, 21. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. In John chapter 8, 12, it says this, outside of the conversation, 
He says, I am the light of the world. Jesus is one that identified himself that he will bring light into the darkness. You see, this is why a lot of people don't like to talk about Jesus. They like to talk about God. Because when you talk about God, it is such a generic conversation that it may or may not mean anything to you at all. And God in prayer is the two words that are being used today to kind of throw out there of some sort of religion, but yet not really talking about who Jesus is in our relationship with him. Jesus is the one who shines the light in the darkness. If, if we are living in a sinful situation, that light will be eventually shown upon that and shined upon that that Jesus becomes the light of the world. And sometimes the light is just too bright for us. Sometimes we just don't want to seek after him because we know we're going down the wrong path or a wrong direction. You know, there comes a time in our conversations with him that we have to be completely honest with who we are and where we are in this world of ours. That we have to understand that Jesus is the light, and that Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the way, and he is the direction and the path that we should be led by in everything that we do. It's just like this church. I love that we're having this meeting tonight or this gathering together because it gives us an opportunity just to be with one another and to reemphasize how important the scriptures are how important it is to follow after Jesus. How important it is that no matter what happens to, to us and, and what vision that we have, we know that we have a firm foundation in Christ Jesus. The world that we know it today are twisting and actually throwing out the word of God because they just don't like what it says. And they're doing some odd things out there, even churches. Churches that have been stable for many years have turned into different directions, trying to meet the things of this world, and we're going to eventually just fall flat on our face because this world needs a light. This world needs this church and us to be able to shine in the midst of a darkness that is out there. They need to be introduced to a loving God. They need to be introduced. And we have to continue in that pursuit to make sure we are prepared to share that light. Because if we live in darkness, we are not going to want to share the light of Jesus. If we live in darkness, we're not going to want to share at all. Because we ourselves are going to be struggling in this. People want to see someone successful when it comes down to the direction that they want to go. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you're having marital problems, you're not going to look up somebody, a marital counselor, that's been divorced five times. You're not going to do it. If you don't want an answer, you probably will do that, but you don't want to do that. If you are seeking after godly advice, then, then you're going to be seeking after those, a pastor or someone that you are confident in that has had a, a relationship with the Lord and that is uplift. You are not going to go to someone who has failed in areas. We, we are a great witness when we fail because we can say we've been there. We've been there. There's nothing wrong with that. It's our story. It's our testimony. We can shine light with somebody to somebody else in and through our failures in life. But yet when we seek after someone, when we really need answers, Nicodemus needed answers. And he went directly to Jesus Christ. He didn't go to his Pharisee buddies. He didn't say, hey, what do you think about this Jesus guy that's walking around? What do you think? No, he said, I'm going to go to him in the middle of the night. I didn't tell anybody. And he spoke with Jesus. There are times in our lives that we just need to sit back and we need just to be still and say, Lord, I just need to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. There are times in our life that we, we just need to understand, not just for you, but for people who you will come in contact with. You see, if you're only doing this for you, then we miss the point. 
If you're only going to church because of just for you, then we miss the point. That it is to be able to tell people about the light of the world. It's being able to tell people about who Jesus is. And if you have the app, I listed a whole bunch of other scriptures there that can, can that points toward the light and Jesus being the light of this world. So as we go into this new adventure, so to speak, as a church, there's a, there are many things that the scripture tells us that we need to stay focused on. And one of them is Jesus. One of them is not to compromise. One of them is to make sure that the scripture is the basis of what we do. One of them is, is the directive that we go. All of us are a part of this body of Christ. All of us has, has, has a vision and have the direction that we would like to see and that we pray for of this church. But, but I hope that in the foundation of all of that is always Jesus. It's always Jesus. Because if we miss out on that, then we miss out on the very structure. And I have no doubt that tonight that that's what we're going to hear. I have no doubt that, that tonight that, that that's going to be a part of all of our hearts, that we want what God wants. We want the man here that God wants to have here. We want the direction of our church to go in the direction that God wants us to go in. You see, there, there have been so many studies over the years as far as the personality of the church. Does the personality of the church follow the, is, is it the pastor or is it the people that's within the church? There are great studies. In fact, there are classes at seminary that deal with this, the personality of the church. Should, should the personality of the church change just because the pastor left? Should, should the personality of the church be different because now, now but yet, but w- when we bring in everybody within the church body, because the scripture says, that we are one body, and that there are some of us that are the hands, some of us that are the feet, some of us are that of the mouth, some of us are the ears, some of us, we all have a purpose in God's kingdom, and I believe that the personality of the church consists of everybody in the church and everybody that we have. This morning, I, I watch a lot of church services after the church service is over. Just to kind of, I don't know, be that fly on the wall. Have y'all ever done that? Just to see what everybody else is doing? Because that's the end thing. You know, that we know that there are people who watch our church, our church and we know that, that somebody watches another church. And I'm just, just kind of curious of, of how things go on. But, I, but I, I noted something that was very interesting in our area. That there are churches that have nobody to lead in worship. I mean, nobody. They're using tape, or they're using some other method. We have such a great talent in our church. Um, Are y'all with me on this? Because we have a great talent in this church, a personality. We have a great worship pastor with Robert, and, and he opens up that door to where we see so much talent that has blossomed here on the stage. I mean, we, we are so blessed with that, and I hope that you see that. If you, if you don't believe me, just start looking at some, be the fly on the wall at some of these other churches and see who's leading the worship. And they're trying, they're doing everything they can, have nothing against that. But because of the personality of our church, we thrive there because of the body of Christ. Because of, of who you are, we thrive. And all of that personality should be used within the, within the body of Christ. And if it's not, then we're just missing out on everything that God wants to do here. Every church has a personality, but we should all be based upon this one thing, that Jesus is the light of the world. And I know that we all have that in common. This conversation there, there was not any leaping or running or praising God, as I mentioned earlier. We don't even really know exactly what happened to Nicodemus. We, there, are two other, there are two other verses that, uh, that point us to Nicodemus later on. John chapter 7, verse 50, and John chapter 19 is the only two other times that we see Nicodemus come about. One of them in John chapter 7 he was trying to give 
an understanding about the law when they were accusing Jesus of something. So he was trying to do it in a way that, that he wasn't really for Jesus, but he really didn't stand up for him personally. John chapter 19, uh, it, sa it says this, that he was the one that went to prepare Jesus' body. And so we see those two things happen. So we don't, there was no time when, when Nicodemus that made that profession of faith where he said, I understand what it means to be born again. I understand what it means to have eternal life. I, I understand everything. He kind of left it open for us. It's like in our conversation this morning, in our life, has it been closed up for you? Do you know the answers to those things for your life? Do you know without a doubt that you, that you have confessed and you have lifted him up, you have asked him to your, into your life, that you had this born-again experience? That you know without a doubt that Jesus is the light of your world and your direction? You see, it takes us to be in that position to be able to share with other people that come into our church and that when we go out into the neighborhood. You see, if you're like, if you're like me, when people come from a church and they come knocking on my door, I wonder, first of all, who it is, and then I, I wonder just why they're here. And we had one come knocking on our door many years ago, and they, and they said, we're not ever going to tell you what church we're from. We just want to tell you about Jesus. And it was so refreshing. Now, I knew about Jesus. I knew who he was, and I, and I told them, yes, I, I know who Jesus is, but they, they wanted to share with me anyway. And so they shared the plan of salvation and everything, and I expressed again, yes, I'm, I'm the pastor of a church here, and yes, I, one of the requirements of being a pastor is being saved, okay? And so, so but they, they, they went through, and they thanked me for their, the, the time. But it was unique to me because they were not promoting the church, but they were just promoting Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with promoting our church, nothing wrong with telling us where, where we are or anything. Because, because we want to introduce Christ to them. But yet it was just unique that, that there was no other reason that they were out. We had, a, uh, we had a bread ministry at our church for many years. And we got the names of everybody that was new to our area uh, through the water company. And uh, we would deliver on Wednesday nights, we would deliver loaves of bread to those families. Now, if you're like me, it was a good gesture, but I probably wouldn't eat the bread. Because, you know, I am, I am a little paranoid about people, strange people bringing food to me. And I probably get that from the police department a lot. Because there are people who bring food to the police department a lot. And if you ever do and you don't know anybody at the police department, trust me, the food's going to be thrown away. Because, because there's a lot of enemy of police out there that will bring food that have contents in it that is not good for the body, okay? And so, so you're sometimes, anyway, so we had a bread ministry, and that bread ministry brought more people into our church than I ever could imagine because it introduced to them Jesus as the light of the world. And on that, we, didn't, we just gave them the loaf of bread with a little tag about where we are and, uh, and that we love them. We didn't share Christ with them. We didn't uh, prolong the conversation. We just wanted to let them know, welcome them into the neighborhood. And we had more people come because of that. And, and, I, and it was just because I, be, I believed that we were being the light that Jesus wanted us to be. You see, a friend that comes to you and just wants to share what's going on in their lives, they don't want, they don't want to be beat over the head with the scripture. They don't want to be beat over the head with the Bible and say, well, this is why you're going through this, you sinner. You've made these decisions in your life, and because of that, this is why you're suffering. You know, people don't want to hear that. What they want to hear and what they need to hear about how much Jesus loves them and how much God loves them and how much, how much that their life could be so different if we just look at it from that perspective. Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Get out of his business. 
church. Get out of his business. It's not up to you to decide and determine what sin is, is needs to be out of somebody's life. That is the Holy Spirit of God's decision. You can only see when, I, I remember one time when somebody came to our church and they, they came every Sunday with a, probably a blood alcohol level of somewhere, somewhere of 3.0 or so, stumbling in the church, sitting in the back. And we had people in our church that said, do, do we want to usher them out? No, we don't want to usher them out. There was a time when I remember he came forward, completely drunk, almost not being able to make it. And I'm, believe me, I'm used, to, I'm used to dealing with drunks all the time. I'm used to dealing with people who's had too much, too much drugs, too much alcohol. And, but yet, again, they need to feel and see our love. Not just for them, but for someone else that is sitting in the congregation. Someone else that is this, just in the back corner and just watching of what's going on and how we treat people. Jesus responded as the light of the world. We also need to respond as the light of the world. It wasn't up to me to try to sober this guy up. It wasn't up to me to try to point him in the direction that he needed to go. What it was up to me was to share Jesus every time he stumbled to the front of the church. Every time. And he became a deacon of our church. I'm telling you. Years later, he became a deacon in our church. We had one who came every Sunday that used drugs out in the parking lot before he came into the church. I used to tell him all the time, you don't have to be high for me to sound good. You know, you don't have to do that. You don't have to use drugs. And he became a deacon in our church years later. I'm telling you. Now, now some of them has a sordid past. Yes. We have been, a, we were accused of, of, uh, bringing people that nobody else would bring into the church. Yes, and I was so proud of our church because we, we opened our hearts up to those that many others would have thrown out and kicked out because it wasn't our responsibility. It was the Holy Spirit of God, and he changed their life. We had a, we had a pretty awesome youth group. But we had to have, and I'm not kidding, we had to have, Joe can testify to this, Joe, uh, we, we, had, we had to have a security team on Wednesday night for our youth group because they were kind of crazy. And, we, and, the, and those kids were out there because no, every other church had thrown them out. And we saw many of them come to know the Lord. There are many of them in jail today, but there are also many that came to know the Lord then. So Jesus is the light of the world, and we need to stress that. I hope we use our personality in this church to be that light. No matter how we feel, no matter how, what people are going through, we need to be able to share God's love with them. In a few moments, we're going to have a, a time, just a quick time of invitation, and this is a time for you just to have a conversation like Nicodemus did with Jesus. Standing where you are, if you need to come to the altar, if you need somebody to pray with you, I'm always here to pray with you. And, and I encourage you, whatever you do, that you don't leave out of this place not having a conversation that you need to have with Jesus. Because just like Nicodemus, he didn't come have this opportunity ever again. The next time that he was t talking about Jesus, and the last time, was at his grave. You see, there comes a time when the conversations become urgent. And I think that today, the conversation could be urgent with you. And it, we need to have that conversation. Let's stand together as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for an opportunity to be able to open your word up today. We pray, Father, for your guidance and for your love and for the movement of your spirit. We thank you so much, Father, for all that you've done within our lives, and we just lift you up and give you the praise and give you the glory. We thank you so much, Father, for an opportunity to be able to just have a conversation with you right now. And we lift you up in Jesus' name, amen.
This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross and beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God. King Jesus. And this is our God, and this is who he is. He loves us. This is our God.